Clap your hands. Just the way we praise him. Okay, praise to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and peace to everyone that's here in the name of Jesus. Peace to everyone that's watching us live on the internet and also listening on the phone line. And as always, it's good to stand before you on the Lord's Sabbath day. It is not my Sabbath day. It is not a, the Christian Sabbath day. It's the Lord's Sabbath day. And it's only one Lord's Sabbath day, and that's the seventh day of the week. You can read that from Genesis to Revelation. No matter what modern-day Christianity tries to say is changed, if it, if it was changed, we would be able to read it in the Bible. But there's one thing we can't read is that Jesus changed the Sabbath day, or any of his disciples changed the Sabbath day. The only person that could change the Sabbath day is the one who gave it, and that's the Lord. We know the Bible says the Lord says, I'm God and I change not. And Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Sabbath day is still good to this day. And the title of the lesson is Serving God Requires Discipline and Obedience. So you got to have both of them. Because you can be disciplined, but if you don't obey what you are disciplined under, you might as well just be a willy-nilly, fly, flying in the wind somewhere. Because we got discipline is taught in the military. Military is really tough on discipline. They teach you that. That's the thing that they teach you, discipline. But they also tell you if you're going to be disciplined, then you have to obey the orders that you're coming under. So you can have some real good discipline. If you go against the chain of command, they call it court martial, non-judicial punishment, whatever it is. You're going to get some kind of repercussions from not obeying. And this is the same way with God. Serving God requires discipline and obedience. You can be disciplined in his word, but do you show up when you're supposed to? You know, do you keep the high days? Do you have the fruits of the spirit? It all points down to discipline and obedience. So we're going to read this, and we're going to get some understanding. And when you get out of this lesson, even though it came up on short notice, I did the best that I could. We're going to get some understanding. Let's start it off in Ephesians 4. Because we're going to lay the foundation of what God we serve. That's the God of Israel. And the God of Israel has laws that we need to maintain. Just like this, you got city laws, federal laws, even God has laws. But people think he don't have, you don't have to serve God. You serve him your way, I serve him my way, but I can't serve a God like that. The God I serve has guidelines and requirements that we need to adhere to. It seems everybody else has laws, but God don't have no laws. Like you don't have to do nothing, just believe. But you can't even read that in the Bible. But let's start in Ephesians 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 5. Ephesians 4 and verse 5, go ahead. One Lord. One Lord, right? That's what we're dealing with, one Lord. Go ahead. One faith. And only one faith. That one Lord has one faith, and what else? One baptism. And one baptism. It's only one. There's only one way to baptize somebody. There's only one faith, and it's only one Lord. Go ahead. One God and Father of all who is above all, and through all, and in you all. So that one God, which is the Father, he's above everything. And he's through all, and he's in you. And how does he get in you? By opening up this book and eating it, reading this word. That's the only way you're going to get it. You can't do a book report just reading the back page of the, of the back cover of the book. Just like you can't understand the word of God just by reading the back portion of it, which is the New Testament can't get the full understanding. And that's the only way you're going to get the Father in you is to read this book. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. And I quoted this earlier, but we're going to read it. Because if it's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, it's all the same. Which amazes me that there's so many different Christian denominations out there, and they all teach something different. That sounds like many lords to me, many lords and many faiths and many baptisms. But the books say one Lord. Hebrews 13 and verse 8, read it. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So Jesus Christ, the one that's 
pattern after modern day Christianity. According to the Bible, if they carry the church with them on Sunday, this scripture is right in there. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the Jesus that they follow, he has no guideline. His only requirement is that you just believe. You don't have to do nothing but believe. But if you're going to serve that, that's the Jesus I would like to serve. As a matter of fact, I served him at one point in my life. And it was good serving him because you could do whatever you want to do, eat whatever you want to eat. You could party on Saturday night, wake up Sunday morning if you woke up. If you woke up late, you can do the late service. But as long as you put your two hours in with this Jesus, you was good to go. But now when I got some understanding, the Sabbath day is more than just two hours. It's, it's exactly what it means. Sabbath day, 24-hour period. It has a beginning and it has an ending. It don't start when you wake up in the morning and go to church. Let's go to uh, Genesis 26. And let's look at Abraham and see how he served God. Because Abraham was disciplined. The Lord told him, look, leave your household. He was like, okay. He didn't even bat out. He was gone. Can't say that for some of us these days that's still living at home. But that's another lesson. Genesis 26, and pick it up at verse 1. And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went into Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down unto Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So Isaac had some, uh, some more plans. He wanted to go into Egypt, but the Lord appeared to him and said, Look, don't go to Egypt, man. Don't go. Go to the land which I shall tell thee of. Go ahead. Sojourn in this land, and I will be, be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee, unto thy seed, I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swore unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto the seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So the same blessing that he gave Abraham, it got passed on down to Isaac, okay? And he said, and I will make thy seed to multiply like the stars of heaven, just like he told Abraham, and I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Verse 5, go ahead. Because that Abraham obeyed my voice. Because Abraham obeyed the voice of the Lord. The Lord told him to do something. What did he do? He obeyed him. He did it. And what else? And kept my charge. And kept his charge. And what else? My commandments. And the commandments. My statutes and my laws. His statutes and his laws. Abraham did all this. That's where the obedience comes in. When you serve God, you obey his laws, his statutes, and his commandments. We can read that throughout this whole Bible. And what got you in trouble is disobedience. When you don't obey his laws and his statutes and his commandments. That's the bottom line, brothers and sisters. Go to Matthew 10. I mean, Hebrews 4. Because when you start serving this God, things start happening to you. Bad things. But they good on your part. Because you become a discipline. And one thing about, one thing I learned when I started going through all this trouble with your family, you can read it in the book. Jesus said it's going to happen to you when you start obeying this word. It's going to happen. But are you disciplined enough to go through it? Because you have to endure until the end, according to the Bible. Then you can say, I'm saved now. Because I'd have made it all the way to the end. Not saying a sinner's prayer. And we believe you've been born again because you said that prayer. While you're still eating that pork chop. You've been born again. But keep, let's go to Hebrews 4 and pick it up at verse 12. Read that one verse, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tense of the heart. So the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even to dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow and the descent and the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This book will cut you up, and at the same time it will heal you. 
But once you get this word in you, it's going to push out all that foolish thinking that you did have. Because the Bible says it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of your mind. Where do you start? Where does the thought start? Right here in the mind. And you know when you're doing something wrong. Because you can, you can, your mind will convict you. And that's that word. That's that, what they call it, that angel on this side telling you, hey, you should be doing that. That's your mind telling you. I shouldn't be doing this. And that's what the word of God is. It's that quick and it's that powerful. And it will cut you. And once it starts cutting you, it's going to start cutting your family. Because they're the first ones, your first line of defense, when you start serving God, is in your household. Let's go read it. Matthew 10. And everybody that's came into this truth, <coughs> this has happened to all of us. We can all, if I get a show of hands, ask for a show of hands, do your family hate you? Everybody's hands are going to go up. Let the family talk about you. Everybody's hand is going to go up. Because it starts within the household first. The Bible says that. We've all been hated. But Jesus told us, look, they hated me before they hated you. So don't even worry about it. They hated me first. Hebrews, Matthew 10, and pick it up in verse 34. Go ahead. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Now here's Jesus now. He said, I didn't come to send peace. So much for peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Jesus said, I didn't come to send peace. What did he come to send? But a sword. And what does a sword do? It cuts. It divides. Just like we said, the word of God is that quick. It's powerful, and it will cut and divide. Go ahead. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So now this is full-fledged battle within the household. Father against daughter Mother against daughter-in-law. All this is happening within the house. And this ain't no regular argument about, you know, you eating up all the food or you don't leave the toilet seat up, stuff like that. This is argument over this word. And this amongst grown people. We got people in here that have grown children that come into this word, and now they're grown children don't even want to speak to them. Or your parents don't even want to talk to you. Your siblings don't want to talk to you. Go ahead. And the man's foes shall be they of his own household. So a man's foes gonna be of his own household. Go ahead. He that loveth, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So you see what's going on. In order to serve this God, you have to put your the Lord before your kids. Because believe me, your family is the first ones that's going to try to trip you up. And we're going to show you this in this Bible, yo. They're going to be the first ones to try to get you to come on back to the other side. Keep reading. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Okay, so we dealt with the mother and the father and the daughter and the son. Go to Luke 14. Because it starts at the top and works its way down. I remember when I told my mother I wasn't doing Christmas no more. She got mad. She said, well, I'm going to send you a card anyway. Well, I returned to send it. <laughs> I'm going to send it back. <laughs> you know, you just go make me do something, you know? I mean, come on. Is Christmas that important? That you got to send me a card to ease your conscience? And they, try to, they would try to put you on the spot. Go ahead. I mean, really, ain't nothing wrong with it. If you really think about it, just take the card. It might have a little money in it, you know? <laughs> and they will put you on the spot at work. But you got to serve the one true living God, and that takes discipline. You got to stand up. Somebody got to stand in the gap for the Lord. Because if you don't, believe me, it's somebody else that will. Because he's going to purge out all those who don't want to do what's supposed to be done. Luke 14, the start of verse 25. Go ahead. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. So we covered in Matthew mother and father and children, but now you got your wife and your brothers and your sisters involved now. Because households consist of more than moms and pops. You got siblings as well. 
So you got to hate them as well. And the, the, it's not saying hate them, because hate is a strong word. But the love that you have for the Lord, compared to them, it's going to be hate. Because I'm telling you, they're going to try to trip you up. They're going to do every little thing to put you on the spot. And it's going to take something dramatic for them to understand that you mean business. Whether it be not being at your daughter's wedding, or not attending your brother's wedding, or they may even have a funeral on a Saturday. Somebody real close to you, and you're supposed to be there. But the books say you got to love the Lord more than them. Because the books say, let the dead bury the dead. But they will try to do that, and it's going to take something dramatic for them to let you know that you mean business. This ain't no Sunday worship where you can put your God on the back burner just to attend some function that your family is doing. You put the Lord on the back burner, he's going to put you on the front burner. Because the Sabbath day is a Sabbath day. It's his day. I don't care what anybody else's family is doing. It's his day. And that's the discipline factor that we have. Sunday worship has no discipline. You are following a false god. Keep reading. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he has sufficient to, fu to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it. All that behold, it began, it began to mock him. So Jesus is giving you a good analogy. He said, look, serving me is not hard. It's not, it's not going to be a cakewalk because people are going to come against you. Now you got to consider the cost. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for the hatred that your family is going to give you? Are you ready for your friends to talk about you, the friends that you used to hang out with you can't hang out with them no more because they're going to try to drag you back into that old lifestyle that you left. You can't do it. Jesus said consider the cost because if you, if you don't want to do this, I'm giving you the option. You can either follow me and take this hardship or just go on and take the easy road and eat, drink, and be merry and soul. I'm good to go. But then you're going to die and you're going to wake up and go straight to the lake of fire. So it's up to you. Keep reading. Saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him with, the, with that him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off and sendeth an amb ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So you got to consider the cost, because once you go down this path, I'm telling you, they're waiting on you to come back. And once you step back over that line again, they're going to be like, see, I told you. I told you that stuff you was doing wasn't right. You was reading it wrong. God loves you no matter what you do. Please. Let's go to Job 2. Let's look at an example of, of how your first line of defense is in your household because they're going to be the first ones to try to trip you up. Let's look at Job. Job chapter 2. Because Job, the books say Job was an upright man and his house was in order. But then when the drama started coming, Job still maintained his integrity. And that's what we have to have. Job 2. And pick it up at verse 1. Job chapter 2 and verse 1. Go ahead. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and that sheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou 
moveth me against him to destroy him without cause. So now the Lord called Job a perfect and upright man. That's a big statement. The Lord called Job a perfect and upright man. He fears God and he hated evil. Go ahead. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath with he give for his life, but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee curse thee to thy face. So the Lord told Satan told the Lord, look, you know, he got some good health. Let me put some disease on him. I bet he'll curse you to your face. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went so went Satan forth from pre, from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sword boils from the sole of his feet unto his crown. And he took him a poster to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. So look, at, look what's going on. His wife is trying to trip Job up. What do we read? If you, if you put your wife before the Lord, he don't need you. And this is Satan right here. Satan is working through her. This, wasn't, this did not come from her idea. The Lord told Satan, look, Satan told the Lord, look, let me put some disease on. I bet he'll curse you to your face. So what did he do? Satan went right to his wife, right through the household. His wife tried to trip him up. But what did he tell her? Go ahead. But he said unto her, thou speakest as one of a foolish woman speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So that was the last resort. That was the first resort. He went to his wife. And he called her a fool. He maintained right there. And he said, look, woman, you a fool. You better get out of my face with that crazy talk. Check there on the spot. And then later on in the chapter, went through his friends. His friends tried to, you know, come at Job thinking he did something. But that's how it works when you're serving the Lord. It starts in the household, and then it ends up with your friends. Let's go to Ephesians 6. And if you're not equipped, if you don't have your self girded up, you're going to fall. You're going to go for the okie doke and it's over with. You're going to be right back to putting that tree up in your house. Eating that swine. And probably start going back to church on Sunday. Like the book say, what is it? A dog returning to his own vomit? You might as well. Because the book says it's hard. Once you, once you come into this truth it's, and you fall away from this, the book says it's almost it's impossible to bring you back. Because you done had the best. And when you throw away the best, there's nothing else to offer to bring you back. Because you had it. That's why you got to hold on to this. Let's go to Ephesians 6. You got to gird up. Because if you ain't girded up with this, it's a done deal. You got to stay girded up. You got to put this on every day when you wake up. And this is the whole armor of God. And it's all about knowledge. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Pick it up. Go ahead. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor. You got to have all of it. You can't be missing one piece out of this armor. Because if you're missing one piece, that's your Achilles heel, they call it, right? Your weakness. And that's where they're coming at you. That's what Satan is coming at you, at your weakness. That's why you got to stay girded up. What's your whole armor? Go ahead. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So you got to put on the whole armor so you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, because he's real crafty. Wiles is what? Willie. Remember Wiley e. Coyote? Wasn't he slick? But he wasn't Wiley. His name was Willie. Right here. Satan, because he's going to come at you. And he ain't going to come at you in person. He's going to come at you through family members, just like he did Job. But if you ain't girded up, it's a done deal. Go ahead. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt 
about with truth. So you got to have the pants on, right? That's the truth. And what is the truth? The word is truth. Go ahead. And have it on the breastplate of righteousness. So you got to have your shirt on, the breastplate of righteousness. And what is righteousness? It's word of God, your action. Keep reading. And your feet show, show with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And you got to have your shoes on. That's the gospel of peace. And that's none other than the word itself. Go ahead. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Got to take the shield of faith, which is your belief, to do what? Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So when Satan starts throwing them darts at you, you got your shield up. You got your belief up. You got something to say to counteract those darts. You got your shield of faith? No, no, no. The book don't say that. This is what the book say. And you will see. The book say resist the devil and he'll run from you. And that's what people do when you open this book. They ready to go. <laughs> Keep reading. And take the helmet of salvation. So you got to have your hat on. Salvation. That's the truth as well. And what else? And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. So your whole armor consists of the entire word of God. If you're missing any piece of this, you're done. That is your weak point. What do they say? No shoes, no shirt, no service? Try to go get served with no shoes on. You better go put some shoes on, then you can get something to eat. Or come in there with no shirt on. Uh-uh. Go put a shirt on, then you can get something to eat. Same way with this word of God. If you're missing any part of this armor, Satan will eat you alive. That's why you got to stay girded up. This is like the American Express, right? Don't leave home without it. If you ain't got it here, it better be here. Or somewhere within range where you can get it. Because I like, everybody likes to debate and quote, but when it's time to really get down to business, open up that wallet and take out American Express. Here, read this. And that's the discipline. That's the discipline we need to have. We got to do more than just open this book up today. You got to do this every day. Because the Bible says meditate in the word day and night. That's 24-7. Acts chapter 5. Let's look at Peter. Acts chapter 5. Acts 5, we're going to pick it up at verse 12. Because one thing, when a little persecution comes about, people usually fold after that. Because if you're doing good for some reason and you get beat up for it, well, I ain't going to do that no more. I'm going to go on back. I ain't going to mess with that no more. But when it comes to the Lord... You're getting beat up all the time. So what do you do? You get back up, and you keep doing the same thing. You don't turn away from what you was doing that got you knocked down. You get up and do the same thing, just like this angel told Peter now. Acts 5 and verse 12, go ahead. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And on the and of the rest there's no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the, le the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Now here are the apostles, you know, Jesus, the Lord is working through them, they're healing people, casting out unclean spirits. And this is some good stuff. But whenever you got good stuff going on, you always got some haters. It's always some haters there. Verse 17, go ahead. Then the high priest rose up. And this is the high priest. These are the religious guys. These are the ones that are supposed to be doing this. But we know they ain't working for the Lord. They're looking for their own self-gratification. They want praise from among the people. So they are the ones that should be doing all this healing, healing the sick, casting out demons. But in, other, in, in this sense, they hating on the apostles for doing it. And these are good works. Keep reading. Then the high priest rose up and all that they were with him, 
which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Now they mad at Peter and them for doing all these miracles. And what did they do? Go ahead. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. Now that's something for a religious leader to have that kind of power. To put his hands on you and throw you in jail. Keep reading. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of, the, of this life. But the angel of the Lord opened that prison, and what did he do? He told them, look, you go back there and you do the same thing you was doing before. Don't even deviate. Go on back and stand in that goat stand, speak in the temple to all the people, all the words of this life. Go ahead. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and talked. And when they heard that, they didn't take, waste no time. They did, that's where the discipline came in, and then the obedience after that. The angel told them, you go speak into the temple. And they went early in the morning. They didn't waste no time. Go ahead. But the high priest came, and they that were with them, and called the council together, and all the sending of the children of Israel, and sent to, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we, uh, when we had opened, we found no man within. So the high priest took, told the officers to go get them, and when they went to the prison, they was gone. What happened? Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. So now they figured, look, these dudes probably escaped. But what did they see? Go ahead. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So it was like, man, them dudes, they didn't go. They standing right there in the temple where you grabbed them and threw them in prison. They standing right there teaching the people again. Go ahead. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. So now they come to a different approach now. Before they violently took them and threw them in prison, so now they're coming to a different approach now. We, gonna, we ain't going to do it with violence this time, because the people might not like us, being we the high priests. But go ahead. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So he told them, look, after they got him before the council, they said, look, didn't we tell you not to speak in this man's name? What's wrong with you, man? Stop telling me about Christmas. I ain't trying to hear it no more. But keep reading. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. He told them, look, we're going to obey God rather than you. And that's what Jesus said. If you, don't, if you love your father and mother more than me, I don't need you. Because if you love them more than me, you're going to do what they say to please them instead of obeying God. Keep reading. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hung on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior for the for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so I also, the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them to obey, to them that obey him. So he said, look, we are witness of these things. We saw Jesus. Y'all killed him. The Lord raised him up. But he said, look, we are witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. You only get the spirit if you obey in God. Let's go to John 14 and read it. That's what people don't get. You got to obey God in order to get his spirit. Because if you ain't obeying him, <laughs> I don't know what spirit, well, I know what spirit you got, but it ain't, it ain't the one you need to get you salvation. John 14. <clears throat> John 14, and we're going to pick it up at verse 15. John 14 and verse 15. Okay, go ahead. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, this is Jesus. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And what? 
and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So if you love Jesus, you're going to keep his commandments, or you're going to obey him, and then you're going to get that comforter. So what if you're not keeping the commandments? You ain't getting no comfort. Keep reading. Yeah, skip down to 21. I'm sorry. He that hath commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So he that loveth Jesus, he that has my commandments and keeps them, it is he that loveth me. And if you love Jesus, you're going to be loved by the father. Because they one and the same. The father told Jesus exactly what to say. He told him to say this. And if you don't keep Jesus' commandments that the father gave him to tell you, you're just spitting in the father's eye. And that's one person you don't want to mess with. Because he don't have no problem destroying this whole world with you in it. That's why Jesus is the intercessor. But go ahead, keep reading. Judas said it un unto him. Not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine but the fathers which sent me. So Jesus said, he that, if you don't love Jesus, you ain't going to do nothing he say. That's the bottom line. Because Jesus said in, in Luke, why call me Lord and you don't do nothing I say? People are under this disguise of love, but when you try to show them that love is keeping the law, they want to get Holy Ghost on you. You don't understand. You got to have a spirit. Okay. 1 John chapter 2. One more. Skip down to 26. Go ahead, read that one. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So you see what this Comforter does? He teaches you. He teaches you all things. He don't make you fall out, jump across tables and chairs, and, you know, you'd be sweating. I went to a Baptist church for a while, and I, was, I got made to go. I take that back. I got made to go to the Baptist church. It's, it's probably still out. It was up there on Slauson. Um, I don't remember. I don't remember the name. It's probably still there, though. But anyway, when the people started going crazy, you know, I was little. I didn't know what was happening. But somebody said they're getting the Holy Ghost. I'm like, man, y'all know what I'm talking about. All you hear is some screaming and, ah! And they fall out, and somebody be fanning them, you know? But that's the, that's the Holy Ghost. That's what they told me. But when you open the book and read, the book say the Holy Ghost is going to teach you. How can you be taught if you're screaming and hollering and passed out? And if you got the Holy Ghost, when you come to, what did he tell you? For real, what did he tell you? If that's the Holy Ghost. But you see the foolishness in Sunday worship. Go to 1 John 2. Nobody ever asked that question. The ones that got the Holy Ghost. Never asked the question, what did he tell you? Because nobody ever reads. That's the problem. 1 John chapter 2. And he's going to tell you again the same thing Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments. Go ahead, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, the propiti propitiation. propitiation, I'm sorry, for our sins and not for, our, for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do not, we do, know. We do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So how do we know if we know Jesus? We keep his commandments. Just like he said in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Go ahead. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So if you say you know Jesus and you don't keep his commandments, you're a liar. And one thing you got to do when you read this to people, you got to get them to admit what the commandments are. 
Because when they admit what the commandments are, you got them. But they want to dance around it. But once you get them to admit this, well, if they say the commandments, Jesus said the commandments, what are they? And once you get them to admit that it's all this other stuff, you got them. They done hung themselves. But they will dance around it because you done already hit them right upside the head with what you need to do. This is the discipline you need to serve God. You have to obey his commandments. And this is, Jesus said it out of his own mouth. But they come up with the love doctrine. But love is the same thing, fulfilling of the law. We can read that. But that's another lesson. Let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28, and pick it up at verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I have commanded thee this day, that the, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So now the Lord is speaking to the nation of Israel. He's telling them, look, all you got to do is do what I say. Obey my voice, keep my commandments, and you're going to be blessed. All these blessings will overtake you. We ain't going to read none of the blessings. We ain't going to read them all. All of them going to overtake you. But it's predicated on what you're doing. You have to listen to the Lord and obey his voice. But what if you don't? Skip down to verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So if you don't listen to the Lord, what you going to get? Go ahead. To observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee in this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So you see the Lord is even handed. He's going to reward you if you obey him, and he's going to reward you if you disobey him. He's even handed. I'd rather get the reward for obedience because if you look at the reward for disobedience, it covers from verse 15 all the way to 68. That's a lot of curses. The blessings, 1 through 14, but they was good. But if you want to be cursed, the Lord will deal with you, verses 15 through 68, and that's a whole lot of curses. Now let's go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. So the Lord is even-handed. You get some blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. There is no such thing as blessed and highly favored. If you are serving this God, the God of Israel, the Bible says if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. And I can read that to you. So if you're serving that other Jesus, yeah, you can say you're blessed and highly favored. Matthew 21, somebody open that gate out there. Somebody trying to get in. Matthew 21, and pick it up at verse 23. Okay, go ahead. And when he was come unto the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things, and have gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. So now here the Pharisees, the chief priests, they messing with Jesus. They're like, man, what authority you do this teaching from? Where you get this from? You talk like you, you the man. Somebody had to give you the authority to do this. So Jesus said, okay, I will tell you where I got my authority from if you tell me this. Go ahead. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? So he said, look, John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or was it from men? Go ahead. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? So now he's tripping them up. This is a catch-22 situation right here. It's either or. Go ahead. But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, 
for all, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, we cannot tell. It's like, man, we don't know. What did Jesus tell them? And he said unto them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he, became, and he came to the first and said, son, go work to, today in my vineyard. So now he's going to pull a parable on him. He said, look, a certain man had two sons. And he came to the first son and said, look, go work today in my vineyard. Go ahead. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. So the son said, look, nah, daddy, I ain't going nowhere. I'm tired of working in that vineyard. But then he, he repented, and then he went anyway. Go ahead. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. So his second one said, okay, pops, I'm going to do it. But he didn't go. Go ahead. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. So which one did the father's will? Go ahead. They say unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believe him not. But the publicans and the harlots believe him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. So Jesus put him on the spot. He said, look, these publicans and the harlots, they're going to get into the kingdom before you because they believe John. And it's the same way with us. Before we got into this truth, we was out there in that world. And all of a sudden, somebody came to us with the truth, and we believed it, and we started doing it. As opposed to on that road to destruction, which is broad, and stuck up in one of the mega churches. We understood, and we started doing it. So we did the Father's way. Even though we kicked in the beginning, we repented, and now we're walking that straight and narrow. Because the first son said, look, I ain't going to do it. We always kicked against the truth all the time. But now, all of a sudden, here we are. But let's keep reading. Go to um, Exodus 24. So there's a flip side to this. The nation of Israel, they was the second son. The second son said he was going to do it, but he didn't. And that's what happened to Israel. That's why we're in the predicament we're in. As a nation, our forefathers messed up, threw us in this situation. So now on an individual basis, we have to repent and get ourselves in order. Exodus 24, and pick it up at verse 3. 24 and 3. Okay, go ahead. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said will we do. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, all his judgments, all the commandments, everything. After the Lord spoke the commandments in person, what did they say? Okay, we're going to do it. Go ahead. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. So now Moses, he drew up the contract now. He had to write it down. Go ahead. And he sent young men of the children of Israel which offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood and sprinkled on the altar. So now he put the half of the blood, he put it in basins, and he put it on the altar. And then he took the, sprinkled it on the altar. What else? And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And he took the book and he read it one more time. And what did they say? Go ahead. And they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. And they said it again. All that the Lord has said we're going to do. Be obedient. What else? And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So now they done signed on the dotted line in blood. And once it's signed in blood, it's a done deal. Remember they had that? You can see that in the movie when they, they cut their hand. And, you know, that was supposed to be the, that was the real deal right there. You can't break this. But what did Israel do? They said they was going to do what the Lord said, but what did they do? They didn't do it. 
It was just like the second son. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 9. They said, okay, Lord, we're going to do it, but they didn't do it. They would have been better off saying nope and then feeling sorry later on and then coming back and doing it. But no, nah, they flat out told the Lord, yeah, we're going to do it. And signed it in blood. That's, it's over with. Because once you break that, you've got all hell to pay. Nehemiah 9, and pick it up at verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 1. Go ahead. Now in the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and con confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day and another fourth part they confess and worship the Lord their God. So now Israel separated themselves from the strangers and it says and they stood up in their place and they read the book of the law of the Lord. This is the Lord's law. This ain't Moses law. This is the Lord's law. And they said and they read one fourth part of the day. And another fourth part of the day, they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. So they read the book, what, six hours? And then the other six hours, they was worshiping and confessing and crying. Skip down to, keep reading verse four, go ahead. Then stood upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua and the Bani, Kadmiel, she Shebani, Shebaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Shenaniah, and cry with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. So now they're doing some heavy worshiping because they're crying and carrying on because they knew they had messed up. Skip down to verse 13. Go ahead. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spake it with them from heaven and gavest them, righteous, gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and made us known unto them Thy holy Sabbath. And this is what people don't get. The Lord's Sabbath is holy. This is a holy day. How can you just throw this away and start worshiping the sun? This is a holy day. Go ahead. And commandest them precepts, statues, and laws by the hand of Moses, thy servant, and gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst and promised them that they should go in the and go in to possess the land which thou hast sworn to give them but they and our fathers deal proudly and harden their necks and harden not to thy commandments and refuse to obey neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them now didn't they say they was going to obey the lord but they say they refused to obey Neither were they mindful of the wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and what else? But hardened their necks, and their rebellion appointed a captain, a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, of, and for, forsookest them not. Yea, when when they had made them of molten calf and said, this is thy God that brought thee out of Egypt and had wrought great prov provocations. Yet thou in the manifold mercies forsooketh them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them into in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them. And what is that good spirit? His word. So all he gave was his word to instruct them. Go ahead. And withheld is not thy, man, thy, thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water from their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Moreover, 
Thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of, Sh of Sih Sihon, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Bashan. So all this stuff, even though they disobeyed him, the Lord was still looking out for his people. Why? Because he made that promise to Abraham. That's the only reason that saved Israel was the promise he made with Abraham, and Abraham remained faithful. So if Abraham remained faithful, then the Lord had to keep his promise to Abraham. Abraham is the only one that saved us, y'all. He's the one that made the covenant with God. God made a covenant with him, and Abraham kept the charge. He obeyed the voice of the Lord. He is the most disciplined amongst the seed of Israel. Even though he, the seed came through him, he started it all. He was the one that kept the Lord's charge, his statutes and his commandments. And because he did that, the Lord made a promise to him that he's going to take care of his people. No matter how roughed up and how they act up and clown, he's going to slap them around a little bit, but he still got to keep his promise to Abraham. Because the Lord keeps promises, unlike man. Man breaks promises all the time. But the Lord don't. He keeps his promises. But go ahead. Their children also multiplies thou as the stars of heaven. And, br and broughtest them into, into the land concerning which thou hast promised to their fathers that they should go and possess it. Possess it. So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduest before them and inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them unto their hands with their kings and the people of the land that they might do with them as they would. So he promised Abraham they was going to go into the land with milk and honey. They went up in there. They knocked off the kings. But what else? And they took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, wells, dig, vineyards, and olive yards, and fruit trees, and abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Nevertheless, Thou were disobedient and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets, which, testi which testified against them to turn them to thee. And they wrought great prov provocations. So Israel's obedience lasts for a quick second. Because once they're doing good, they forget about the Lord. And they forgot that was the Lord, it was the Lord that gave them that goodness. But everybody can serve the Lord while you're doing good. Try serving him when you're doing when you down and out. When you ain't got no money. When you ain't got no job. When you're going through something. Because when people go through stuff, the first thing to go is the Sabbath day. I don't want to be around nobody. I'm going through it right now. It's the best place you need to be when you're going through it. So you ain't forsaking your own life. You're putting yourself before the Lord. Well, I'm going through it, Lord. I don't want to have no holy convocation. Okay. You may not make it to the next one. Now you have died in your iniquity. And the books say if you die, if once you turn your back on the Lord and start doing unrighteousness, all them Sabbath days you attended, all them feast days you attended, all them times you passed up on the pork chop, it don't mean nothing. Because you made your decision right then not to keep that holy gathering. And who knows? You don't know when the Lord is going to take you because our time is always. That's why we got to keep walking straight and narrow 24-7. Because you don't know when it's your time. So when it is, your time is up. You need to be upright when, you know, when your time is up. So all this emotionalism, keep it. Anyway, go ahead. I was going to say something else, but go ahead. Therefore, y'all know, know I'm mad at you, but go ahead. Therefore, thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them in the time of their trouble when they cried unto thee. Thou, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. So after they got, the Lord put some drama on them. They started crying to the Lord, and what did he do? He delivered them out of the hand of their enemies, so they started obeying again, but for a quick second. And what did they do? Verse 28. 
but after they had a rest, they did evil again before thee. So there's the disobedience once again. They obey for a minute and disobey for 30 minutes. But go ahead. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercy. So the Lord is real merciful with Israel. He's got mercy on us. Many times he delivered Israel. But then, you know, there's always a straw that breaks the camel's back. He ain't going to deliver us no more as a nation, no more until he come back. That's when we're going to be delivered as a nation. He was delivering them back then as a nation a bunch of times. But now, he's like, I'm through with y'all. I'm going to scatter y'all here and there. And you do what you want. But the ones that's going to get it right, they're going to get it right. And when I come back to get everybody once again, I ain't going to be playing with you this time. But that's another lesson. Go to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. It's all about discipline, brothers and sisters. You got to obey the Lord. It's, it's simple. Just do what he say. It ain't hard. It ain't hard at all. Just You get used to it. It's real easy. It's hard in the beginning because you're getting persecuted on the right hand and the left hand. But once they see you mean business, the persecution eases up. And when you make that statement, then they really get scared because now they know you mean business. Because this ain't no joke. This is not sun worship. This is the God of Israel. 1 Samuel 15. And when you mess up, there's always a straw that breaks the camel's back, and this, this is what happened to Saul. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 1. Go ahead. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto, his, unto the voice of the words of the Lord. So Samuel told Saul, Look, the Lord sent me to anoint you to king over his people. Now listen to what I'm getting ready to tell you because it's coming from the Lord. Go ahead. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So now this is what I want you to do. Go and kill Amalek, utterly destroy him. Don't leave nothing. Slay man and woman, babies too. The Lord gave him an order to kill babies. Oxen, sheep, camel, ass, infant, and suckling. So keep reading. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and till, till I am 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. So now they armed, they armed up now. He got 200,000 footmen. And 10,000 men of Judah. Go ahead. And Saul came to, the, to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart. Get you down from among the um, uh, Amil uh, uh, Amalekites. Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. So Saul is waiting in, in the valley, and he came to the Kenites. He said, Look, I'm not coming to get y'all. Y'all got to get out of here. Or else I'm going to destroy you with the Amalekites. And what did they do? For ye shew kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So the Kenites like, okay, man, we out of here. We gone. And what did Saul do? Go ahead. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Hivala until thou comest to Shur. That is over against Egypt. Now, he started doing good. He started doing what the Lord told him. Started killing all them Amalekites. And what happened? And he took Agag, Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. I can't remember what the Lord said him to do that, to take the king alive. I thought he told him to just destroy everybody. But he took the king alive. And what else did he do? 
and utterly destroy all the people with the edge of the sword. So he destroyed all the people but kept the king. And what else? But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused that they destroy utterly. So what happened? He didn't even listen to what the Lord said. He said, go kill them all. All the animals too. I can't remember what it thus said the Lord take the king alive and all the good stuff. The Lord said, kill everybody in there. Go ahead. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, I repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and had not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So that was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was over with then. The Lord said, it repented me that I made this dude king, because he have turned from, turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. He didn't obey what I told him to do. Keep reading. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set, up, he set him up a place and is gone about and passed on and going down to Gilgal, Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleed, bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So and Saul came to him and said, look, I did exactly what the Lord said, Samuel. See? But Samuel was like, what's all this sheep I hear? What, what, what do these animals come from, man? What you mean you did what you were supposed to do? Go ahead. And Saul said, they have brought them from uh, Amal uh, the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. So now he's told him, Look, I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me this night, partner, and it ain't good. So he said, Say on. And what did he tell him? Go ahead. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go, and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, the Lord but didst fly up upon the spoil? And did his evil in the sight of the Lord. So what did he do? He said, why did you disobey the voice of the Lord and did evil in the sight of the Lord? What is evil in the sight of the Lord? Disobedience. If he tells you, go not in the way of the heathen, for they take a tree, they cut it down, deck it with silver and gold. The Lord said, don't do this. But when you do it, you disobeying God. And what is that? Evil. I don't care how pretty you make the tree look. It's evil in the sight of the Lord. I don't care how bright and shiny those Easter eggs are, it's evil in the sight of the Lord. Because that's a false god. Actually a false goddess, goddess of fertility. And all these other flowers and candy that you do on Valentine's, they're another false god. All that's evil in the sight of the Lord. It may make a woman happy, but she don't know no better because you don't either. It's evil. It's sick and it's evil, and the Lord is going to deal with you. But go ahead. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of the Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and Gilgal. So he's going to blame it on the people. He says, Samuel, I did what you told me to do. I obeyed the voice of the Lord. I went down there. I killed the Amalekites. But I just brought the king. But the people are the one that got the, the good stuff. But you're the king, man. You are the king. They're supposed to obey you because the Lord appointed you to be king over his people. But if you disobeying me, then the people are going to do the same thing. 
Now you done got everybody in trouble. Go ahead. And Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. So I don't care about these good sheep or these good oxen to sacrifice to me. I don't care about that. I wanted you to kill these sheep and oxen. Go ahead. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So now he done lost his job. It's a done deal for Saul now. Keep reading. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Too late now, partner. It's over with. You acknowledge your sin, but the sentence is handed down already. That's like somebody being sentenced to prison for killing somebody, and all of a sudden they lie, now they're sorry for doing it. Okay, you can be sorry, but you're still locked up. You ain't getting out of this. You should have been sorry before you decide to kill somebody. But go ahead. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. Not and, today, partner. It's over with. Go ahead. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel tur turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, it, and it rent. So Saul is doing some heavy praying now. Matter of fact, Samuel walking away, he grabbed his skirt. Please don't go. But the skirt ripped. Go ahead. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. I pray thee before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. So Samuel went on his way, and Saul tried to do some heavy praying to the Lord, but it was over with. Disobedience got him fired. Disobedience will get you fired too in the lake. Let's go to Jeremiah 7. We're going to start wrapping it up. You're going to read a little faster, right? Speed it up. Jeremiah 7. It's a new reader. We're breaking them in. That's all. We're breaking them in. Had a nice long lesson for him. Jeremiah 7. So Saul had no discipline because he feared the people. And if you don't have no discipline, you're going to fear your family members and your friends. And you're going to disobey the word of the Lord, and you're going to end up getting cut off. Bottom line. Jeremiah 7, and pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, which dwell at Mig Migdal and to to happen it to happen Wait, his up. where you at bro jeremiah 7 oh, I'm jeremiah 34. oh man you just got high dude you're supposed to at least read at least three or four months before you mess up like that you doing it early jeremiah 7 and verse 1 Okay, go ahead. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter and at these gates to worship the Lord. And that's what we do with our family members. Hear the word of the Lord. What do we do? Try to read this book to them. I didn't write this. I'm trying to get you to read it. That's all. It's in your Bible, too. Hear the word of the Lord. Go ahead. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in the lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, 
the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord are these. So trust ye not in lying words, and that's what we want to do. We want to believe a lie, because the book says it's going to come a time when people are going to depart from the truth. They're going to be turned into fables. Y'all got to get rid of these phones. Put them on vibrator, turn them off. But people want their ears scratched. Nobody wants to be told what not to eat. It's easy if we could eat everything and anything. Because it was good when we was doing it. And it probably still is, but I know not to do it now. But bacon still smell good to me. I don't care what child, it still smell good. Rib tips, too. Don't nothing beat that barbecue ribs, I'm telling you. But thus said the Lord, don't eat it. You can smell it. It can smell good, but don't eat it. Go ahead. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if ye thoroughly execute judgment between the man and his neighbor, if ye oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to, to your hurt. Then will I cause you to dwell in the place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye still murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not? And come and stand before me in this house, which was called by name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place which was Shiloh, where I set my name at the, at the first, and see what I did to to it for wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spoke unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto the house which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you, to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed, Ephraim. So now this is what Jeremiah is telling him. He's saying, "Look, I cast out Israel or Ephraim, which is the northern tribes. I got rid of them for their disobedience and their idolatry. And now y'all are doing the same thing. Not only I'm gonna get rid of y'all, but I'm gonna destroy this temple that y'all take so much pleasure in. But because y'all are wicked." You defiling the temple. You can't come in here with some craziness in your mind. You defiling this place, messing up the lesson for everybody. Leave it at the door. You're supposed to delight in this Sabbath day. You ain't supposed to be coming up in here arguing. You're just defiling the place. So he said, look, I'm going to cast you out of my sight, and I'm going to destroy this temple. Go ahead. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, and neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. So say, don't pray for these people. I'm through with them. Don't even make intercession. Sentence has been passed. And believe me, when the Lord say it's going to be done, his will is going to be done. Go ahead. See is thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, the children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women eat their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. So now they got the whole family involved in idolatry. And I was looking at this article in the newspaper. It's got holy tears in India. They got some kids, right? The caption says, kids, children of the Guwahati." are dressed as the Hindu god Krishna as the festival marking the deity's birth. So they got the kids dressed up like this pagan god. And they were. It's supposed to be his birthday, I guess. But they got the kids involved. They teaching kids paganism. Because that's where it starts. 
Kids get taught by their parents. We was all brought up in paganism. And now, since we're in this truth, we're teaching our kids just the opposite. Get rid of all that paganism. And sun worship is the biggest paganism around. Because this is actually what it is. You are worshiping the sun on his day, Sunday. But keep reading. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to confusion of their own faces? Therefore, thus saith the Lord, God, behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast, upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all thy ways, in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. So when Israel came out of Egypt, there wasn't no sacrifice in animals. The Lord came down and spoke his laws in person and said, this is what I want you to do. And they said, okay, we're going to do it. That's all it required was obedience to his voice. Just obey his voice. Whatever I tell you to do, just do it. It's all about obedience. But keep reading. But they hearken not, nor incline their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Okay, let's go to Jeremiah 44. So they went backwards and not forward like always. But they disobeyed God. Discipline was gone. And you're going to suffer the consequences for your disobedience. So why not just do right? It's that easy. Just do right. And I believe people would do right if they was taught how to do right. That's why y'all ain't got no excuse. Y'all know what's right. So when you get out there and go crazy, myself included, I'm not exempt from anything. Anybody can go crazy up here. Jeremiah 44. That's where you wanted to go to, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we there now. Go ahead. Verse 1. <laughs> the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, which dwell at Migdal, and to happen and at Noph and in the country of Pathros, saying. So now these Israelites, they fled into Egypt. Because Israel always want to go back into Egypt, right? So now they're back there in Egypt because they're trying to escape Nebuchadnezzar. But it don't matter. So they asked Jeremiah for some words about what thus saith the Lord. Keep reading. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, ye have Ye have, have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon all cities of Judah. And behold, this day they are a desolation, and no man dwelleth therein. Because of their wickedness, which they have committed to provoke me to anger, and they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, yea, nor their fathers. Your fathers, how be it, I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. And that's what people don't think. People don't think that all these so-called holidays, ain't nothing wrong with them. But it's all idolatry. All of them. The Lord hates them all. But you can't tell people that because they, under the guise of, it's, it's good. It's all right. Ain't nothing wrong with it. I, I mean, look, if you look at it, it's really, it's cool, ain't it? No, it ain't. I thought I'd get you, but y'all smarter than that. It ain't good at all. It's evil. But they under the disguise that it's good because they don't know no better. But when you try to tell them, that's when the repercussions come. But serving, serving other gods is straight up idolatry. And the Lord hates it. I don't care how good it may seem. The Lord hates it. Go ahead. But they hearken not, nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness to burn no incense unto other gods. Wherefore, many fury, wherefore my fury and my anger was poured forth 
and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as, as at this day. Therefore now, thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls to cut off from you men and women, children and suckling out of Judah, to leave you none to remain. So now he's telling them, look, y'all got yourselves in this predicament. All you had to do was stop serving the mother gods. Now you did this. You, you made me because of your own wicked acts. Now I have to cut off man and woman, child and suckling out of Judah to leave you none to remain. Go ahead. And that ye <clears throat> provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense unto other gods in the land of Egypt, whether ye be going to dwell, that ye may cut yourselves off, and that ye might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. So what got them in trouble? What got Judah destroyed? Idolatry. So the ones that escaped into Egypt, they doing the same thing. And that's what got them in trouble. That's what Jeremiah's been telling them all through Jeremiah. Stop doing that false worship. Stop doing the false worship. But now when Nebuchadnezzar came down on them, they escaped and went into Egypt and did the same thing that got them kicked out. Go ahead. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers and the wickedness of the kings of Judah and the wickedness of their wives and your own wickedness and the wickedness of your wives, which they have committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? They are not humbled even unto this day. Neither have they feared, nor walked in my law, nor in my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all Judah. So now they ask him for an answer, and this is the answer he gave them. You got yourself in trouble for idolatry? You think you're going to be safe in Egypt? You're doing the same thing. I'm going to get you. And that's the answer he told them. And let's see what the people said. Skip down to verse 15 and read it. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. He's like, man, we ain't listening to nothing you got to say. In other words, I don't care what thus saith the Lord. I'm still going to do what I'm going to do. Go ahead, 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goes forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and, and saw no evil. So he told them, they told them, look, look, we're going to do whatever we want to do, man. Whatever we think of doing, we're going to do. We're going to burn incense to the queen of heaven. We're going to pour out drink offerings unto her, just like we did, just like our fathers, our kings, and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals, and we were well and saw no evil. But that's what got you in trouble. You was living good while you were sinning good, but then when the Lord passed sentence on you, you don't realize that that's what got you in trouble. So now you're going to go to Egypt and do the same thing? They told Jeremiah, look, I ain't, we ain't trying to hear nothing, dude. You can take that word and, and go on somewhere else. Tell it to somebody else because we ain't trying to hear it. And that's what they do. That's what your family do. You try to bring this word to them, they don't want to hear it. Take it and go somewhere else with it. Go back to that church of yours. Maybe they're here. No, they already hear it. That's why I'm bringing it to you. But since you don't want to hear it, Cool. Just sit back and just watch the drama coming. It may not come when you want it, but believe me, it's going to come. Because they have been, once you put this word on them, they have no more excuse. Whether they want to hear it or not, sentence has already been passed because you didn't heard it already. So you just sit back and just watch it play out. All you got to do is keep doing what you're doing. You may go through some hard times and they still doing good over there. Don't worry about it. The Lord is going to bring you up. And if you live to see long enough, if they continue in that folly, you're going to watch the Lord bring that house down. I've seen it. I've seen it personally. It has happened. The 
took some time. It wasn't soon enough for me, but it took some time. But the book says, don't rejoice when your enemy falleth. It happened. I let it go. There was no aha, I told you so. It wasn't none of that. It happened. They was in dire straits, down and out. What can I do? You need some help? If I got the help, I'll give it to you. If I don't, I don't. Because when you went down, I was down too. So now I can't help you. But anyway, keep reading. But since we left off to burn incense to Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we have burned incense to Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women, and to all the people which have given him that answer, saying, The incense that you that ye burn in the cities of Judah and in the street of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings, and your princes, and the people of the land did not the Lord remember them, and came it not unto his mind, so that the Lord could no longer bear because the evil of your doings, and because of the abominations which ye have committed, therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant at as it at as at this day, because ye have burned incense and because ye have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the of the Lord, nor walked into his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies. Therefore this evil is happened unto you. So you see why the evil happened to him? Disobedience. Disobedience, brothers and sisters. Serving God requires discipline and obedience. If you don't have no discipline or no obedience, you're going to get some evil. Evil is going to come upon you. There's too many fair weather Sabbath people that come through here, even at the Israel of God. But it's on a larger scale, but here... I see it all the time. Fair weather servants. The Lord is going to get you. He's going to deal with you. There's plenty of things I could be doing and driving 50 miles to come here. But I do it because thus said the Lord. Only time you won't see me up here is if I'm dead or in the hospital. And if I'm dead, you're going to see me because you'll probably be at the funeral. But it won't be on no Saturday. <laughs> but go ahead keep reading as at this day moreover Jeremiah said unto all the people and to do to all the women hear the word of the Lord all Judah that are in the land of Egypt thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel saying ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands saying we will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. So he told them, look, okay, whatever you said you're going to do, that's cool. I'm going to deal with it. That's cool. But look what's going to happen to you. Verse 26, go ahead. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. So all you people that want to escape and think you're going to have it good in Egypt, I'm going to get you in Egypt too. I'm going to get you. You can't run from the Lord. You can't even hide from him. So he told him, you don't want to listen to me? Then hear what the Lord of the Lord is going to say. I'm going to get you. You're going to die right there. Leviticus 10. And we're almost done. Leviticus chapter 10. And we saw, we can read about a man in Numbers. That for something as simple as picking up sticks, who would have thought when he woke up that morning he would be dead in a couple hours just for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day? 
But that was disobedience. And let's look at the, that the Lord is not a respecter of person. Let's look at this guy, these guys right here. These are the priest's sons. They didn't get exempt from disobedience either. Luke chapter, Leviticus 10, and pick it up at verse 1. Leviticus 10 and verse 1. Go ahead. And Nadab and Abihu, the son of the sons of Aaron took either took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Now the fire on the altar was not supposed to go out. It was supposed to be burning constantly. And that was their job, to keep that fire going. But Nadab and Abihu, they took their censer and offered strange fire. What strange fire? How did they let the fire go out? Because why are you trying to relight it? It's strange fire. Because the fire that was burning, the Lord commanded them to keep it going. So they tried to light it again. And what happened? And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. The Lord killed them on the spot. Reverse flamethrower. They tried to, sh -sh -sh, boom, got them. Didn't matter who they were. These are the priest's sons. So keep reading. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan and the sons of Uz Uzziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said unto Aaron and unto Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, uncover not your heads, neither rent your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. So he said to the other two sons, he told Aaron and his other two sons, he said, look, you better not show no emotion. Now that's hard. Both of your boys just got killed. You're supposed to hold back the tears and keep a straight face. Because if you don't, I'm going to kill you. That's what the book said, right? All for, letting, for just letting the fire go out. Them two boys got killed. Something simple as that. But the Lord don't play. You either do what he says and get a blessing, or you don't and get cut off. Whether you get cut off in an instant or get cut off three years down the road, you're going to get it. Keep reading. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. And ye, and ye shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregations, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Okay, let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, we're almost done. Seem like I just saw y'all yesterday. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Matthew 13, and pick it up at verse 18. Because Jesus told a parable about the sower of the seeds, and he's going to give you the answer what this parable means. Matthew 13 and 18. Go ahead. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth the way which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. And there's plenty of people came through here like this as well. They hear this word, you get them, talk to them about the word, they come in, you never see them again. I think we baptized a brother one time. He ain't been back since. I wonder what happened. I don't know. This was years ago, back at the hotel. Don't know what happened to the brother, but keep reading. But he that received the seed unto stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and Annan with joy receive, receiveth it. Yet, yet hath he not root, root in him himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by... By and by, he is offended. So now this person, he had, he that received the seed in a stony place. 
the same as he that heareth the word, and that now with joy receive it. But since he don't have no root in himself, which means it sounds good, and he's around people that's doing the same thing, but because when persecution, persecution come upon him, because he don't have no root, he don't know how to handle it. So now he's gone. He obeyed for a minute, but now he just went back door again. Keep reading. He also that receiveth seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. And this guy, he lasted a little longer than everybody else. And this is amongst us right now. The Bible says, let the wheat grow with the tares. We are growing up amongst unrighteous people. We got wheat and we got tares right up in here. And we may last a little longer, but in the end result, persecution and tribulation are going to trip us up too. And you're going to be right over there with them tears, Mr. or Mrs. Wheat. Keep reading. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and endureth, and endureth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth. Some in hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now, this is the person that endured all the way to the end. This is what we're trying to do. But I'm telling you, we can always go back door at any moment. We have not reached this part right here yet. Because this person has endured until the end. Any one of us can go crazy at any time. It's in the book. We can read it. Nobody's exempt. Let's go to um, Psalm 107. So bear in mind, we got to walk this path to the end. Don't waver to the right or the left, because once you do, I don't care how long you've been in this word, you can easily go crazy. So just maintain your good works. Don't get caught with your pants down. Psalm 107, and read one verse, verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their inequities, are afflicted. So fools, because of their what? Disobedience. And because of their iniquities, they are afflicted. Don't be a fool. Suffer for righteousness, not for iniquity. Now let's go to um, Hebrews 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Because a fool going to suffer all the time. But when the righteous man suffers, it's for a reason. The Lord is trying to refine you and make you better. To see if you really want to serve him. Because it's always, like I said, you can serve the Lord while everything is good. But let's see if you can serve when things are bad. Look at what happened to Job. Job did it. And the Lord restored him back to where he was and, and even more. Hebrews 5. So don't get into the category of disobedience. Maintain your discipline in this word of God. What I say, Hebrews 5? Okay, Hebrews 5, verse 8, go ahead. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now this is Jesus. Though he were a son... Yet he learned obedience by what? The things which he suffered. Go ahead. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And being made perfect, because he learned through obedience, he suffered, he was made perfect, and now he's our example. But you have to obey him. He, gave, he became author and the eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. So we have to live like he lived. We have to do what he says. You have to obey what thus saith the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And let's look at Paul. 1 Corinthians 9 and pick it up at verse 14. Nine and fourteen. OK, 
Okay, go ahead. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So if you preach the gospel, you got to live out the gospel. You can't be no hypocrite. If you're going to tell somebody what thus said the Lord, then you have to be the example and do what thus said the Lord. Because they're looking for you to get tripped up. They're waiting on you to fall. Keep reading. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that I should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So Paul's saying, look, I'm not preaching this gospel for no glory. I'm not getting nothing out of this, but doing what thus said the Lord, teaching what he told me to do. Because the books say work out your own salvation. I have to do this. Standing here as a watchman, I have to teach you what thus said the Lord. I have to warn you what your consequences are for disobedience. Because if I don't, then I'm at fault. Because it says, woe unto me if I don't preach this. So you like it or not, I could care less. I ain't here to make friends. I'm here to save myself. And if I happen to make a few friends in the process, you know, that's cool. But this ain't not, this is not personal. This is business. You don't have to like me. I don't have to like you. But you got to like this book. But keep reading. For if I do this thing willingly, I have reward. But if against my will, a desp dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that. When I preach the gospel, I, make, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. So Paul is giving you situations that you have to deal with. Every situation is different. Some people want to hear this, some people don't. So the ones that don't want to hear it, you have to approach them in a different way. It ain't all about cutting people's heads off all the time. Some of the time is good, but most of the time it's not. Because the person's head you cut off, they may not recover from it. Now you didn't turn that person away from hearing the word. But keep reading. Right there. Yeah, keep reading. All right. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain thee more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are, that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became as became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things that all men, that I might be all means save, I might by all means save some. So we see all the situations Paul is getting into, you know. You ain't gonna talk calculus with somebody that only stand basic math. You got to go down to their level so they can understand this. Every situation is different. Your sister or your brother, your mother or your father, you have to approach them differently. And that's where your wisdom comes in. Every situation is different. But go ahead. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. So Paul is saying, look, run, I run, I know what I'm doing. And I'm not doing no shadow boxing here. I'm doing this for a purpose. But after I do all this stuff, if I happen to go back door at any time, look what happened, verse 27. But I keep 
under my body and bring it unto subjection. So I have to discipline myself at all times. Bring my body unto subjection. Why? Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So I have to keep myself disciplined. Because after I'm doing all of this, if I just happen to go back door, I'm gone too. So all this stuff that, I'm, that we reading and teaching and understanding, if I go crazy, I'm held in accountable a lot more. Because to whom much is given, much is required. So, like I say, anybody can go back door. That's why the discipline factor is in there. You have to be disciplined in this Bible and understand it and obey the word because you can go back door at any time. Deuteronomy 6. We got three more places. Deuteronomy 6. Four more places. Might be five. I took one out. What time is it? Don't matter. Y'all still here. Deuteronomy 6. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. And this is part of your discipline factor as well. Because if you ain't doing this, you can see the results of it. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 1, go ahead. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye, that ye may do them in the land whether ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Okay, skip down to verse 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now that's the commandment Jesus quoted in Matthew. He said this is the first and greatest commandment, to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and how do you show God you love him? You obey him. You keep his commandments. Whatever he said to do, that's what you do. That's obedience. And there's many examples to show how you love God. First and foremost, he told you, don't have no other gods before me. I'm the only God you're supposed to serve. And he tells you how to serve him right in this book. All you got to do is open it up and read it. And one thing he told you is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week. He didn't say remember the first day. He said the seventh day. Go ahead. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So that's a commandment from the Lord, too. You're supposed to teach your children what thus said the Lord. Like these people, teaching them about their God, they doing it with a passion. You should have the same reverence to your God to teach your kids the same thing. Every kid in here that's five and up, even four and up, if they can read Curious George or whatever that stuff is, they need to be sitting next to their parent with a Bible opened up. There's no reason that no child in here that has the capability of reading, see spot run, should know exactly where Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy is. It's gotta, you got to start them young. You have to. If you ain't started it yet, you better start it right now. If your child is next to you, they should have a Bible too. And I'm looking just to see. Because we're reading this right here. You're supposed to teach your kids. Not just here, but beyond here. And it reflects, when your kids come here, it reflects it on your job. If you're doing your job, your child will be disciplined. Your child will have a book. That's why we had a children's class, to teach the kids a little extra. You come here to get some extra. Beyond that, you should be doing it six days out the week. We see the results when, we, when, you, when your kids come. We, we see what's going on if the parents is on their job. If you ain't on your job, the Lord knows. The covers will be pulled off. Skip down to verse 8. I mean 13. I finish 8. Well, finish 8. Go ahead. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. Okay, skip down to 13 and read that one. 
Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. So you're going to fear the Lord God and serve him only. And if you're going to serve him, you're going to be obedient. Because that's what it's all about. John chapter 3. Because the books, we, the kids are supposed to be our future, right? So let's teach them. Teach them what thus saith the Lord. Since we never had that opportunity. We got it late, but that's a good thing. At least we got the opportunity to get it. And those of us that are blessed to have infants, now you can really start. Instead of forcing them to go to church like they did us, they can see that your delight that's in it coming to the Sabbath. They know. You got your Bible when you leave, they ask you. Especially little girls, you got your head covered. Sometimes the mamas, the daughters will bring the scarves to the mamas in case they forget. But that's where the discipline factor comes in. If you're doing what you're supposed to do, it'll reflect on your children. What I say? John 3? Okay, John 3 and verse 14. Go ahead. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is the first script I learned in, in, in Sunday school. John 3.16. Never knew what it meant till now. Because the book says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. You have to believe. And if you believe in Jesus, you're going to do what he say. But they have thrown obedience right out the window and just stuck you with belief. Just believe on the Lord. Just believe on the Lord, you're going to be saved. That ain't what the books say. Belief comes with obedience. Go ahead. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but, to, but that the world through him might be saved. And how is the world through him going to be saved? Through the obedience. You have to believe in the Lord. Go ahead. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the con condemna condemnation that light is coming into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be may manifest that they are wrought in God. Okay, flip over to John 14. I mean John 12. So you got to believe on Jesus. And with belief comes obedience, because belief is faith. If you got faith in Jesus, you establish the law through what? Through your faith. Now flip over to John 12 and pick it up at verse 42. John 12 and 42. Okay, go ahead. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that see, seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am, I, am come of, I am come a light unto the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejected me, receiveth not my words. Hath one that judges me, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, and he have give, gave me a commandment, what I should say, and what I should speak. So who told Jesus what to say? The Father. So if you're rejecting Jesus, you're rejecting the Father. And what did, he, what did, what did the Father tell Jesus to say? Verse 50. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. So the Father's commandments are life everlasting. 
That's what you need to obey, the commandment. In order to get eternal life, Matthew 22 will tell you what good thing must I do that I may get eternal life. Jesus gave him a point blank statement. Keep the commandments. It's that easy. Keep reading. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Okay, let's go to Deuteronomy 30. We got one more place. So the commandments are life everlasting. And these are the same commandments they're trying to do away with. Get rid of them. Telling you you don't have to keep them. Well, mean that means I can't get eternal life then. But the books say if I keep them, I get eternal life. So I'm gonna go that route. I don't care what you say, Mr. New Testament Christian. You trying to get my eternity kicked out the bucket. But go ahead. Deuteronomy 30 and 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good, in death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So how do you show the Lord you love him? You keep his commandments. Go ahead. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou possess, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. So he said, if you decide to disobey me and turn away and start worshiping other gods, I'm going to kill you. Go ahead. I'll call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, Blessing and curse, therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. So the choice is yours. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, it is to your benefit to choose life. And what is that life? The commandments. Choose life so that you and your kids may live. Now let's go to the last place, Joshua 24. So you got a choice. You can serve the Lord and live or disobey the Lord and get killed and end up in a lake of fire. The choice is yours. We're going to start at verse 14. Joshua 24 and verse 14. Okay, go ahead. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. So we're telling them, look, serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. You know, you got a choice. You got a choice. You can see the, serve the one true living God or you can serve them false gods. The choice is yours. But if you're going to serve the Lord... Serve him in sincerity and in truth. And what else? Go ahead, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. So if you don't want to serve the one true living God, then you got a choice. There's many other gods out there you can serve. But the choice is yours who you want to serve. Go ahead. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name.